Welcome. We are in Chapter 7, the Riemann Integral, and today we cover 7.4, Properties of the Integral. This is our penultimate section of the semester. Only one more after this. Uh, 7.5, we'll talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so 7.4 is sort of a stepping stone to get us there. In this section, two big ideas. We will prove some integral properties that we know and love from calculus. A lot of, frankly, intuitive ideas in this section that we are just proving. But then the second part is not quite as intuitive. We'll look at a sequence of functions and ask if a sequence of functions approaches a limit and if each function in the sequence is integrable, is the limit integrable? And if it is, then do we have this equality? Okay, let's get to it. We are heading toward 7.5, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So in order to get there, a few basic ideas that uh, we'll cover today. We're shoring up some details. We'll talk about properties of the integral, and then we'll also cover sequences of functions. So the first big property is additivity of intervals. So let's assume that f is a function from the interval a to b uh, to the real numbers, and it's bounded and let C be some element in between A and B. Then, F is integrable on the entire interval A to B if and only if it is integrable on A to C and C to B. And if it is, then in this case, the integral from A to B of F is the integral from A to C of F plus the integral from C to B of F. So it seems pretty intuitive, it seems very much believable, but we'll spend a little bit of time seeing exactly why this is true. The proof outline goes like this. Uh, the, there is an if and only if part of the proof, so notice that. So I will be proving that statement in the forward and backward direction. But then there's also an equation part of the proof, and the way we will show that is by showing an inequality in both directions less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. All right, let's get to it. So we start off, here's the statement that we're going to prove, here's the if and only if statement. And so we'll start in the forward direction. Let's assume that given the entire interval all the way from A up to B, that F really is integrable on that interval. What that means by definition is that given an epsilon greater than zero, there is a partition P so that the upper sum of the function over P minus the lower sum of the function over P is less than epsilon. All right, so there is a partition P, and so let me write that out here. It starts at A and it goes all the way up to B. And a partition is really just a set of X values. And I have a bunch of X values in there. And so that's my partition P, all of those X values. So let's add C to that partition if it's not already there. Maybe C is somewhere here. All right. So now this creates really two partitions. I have a partition P1, which is all of my par partition P up through A through C. And then I have a partition P2, uh, C up to B. And C is common to both of those smaller partitions. Now, it should be clear, right? I mean, if the entire partition P has upper sum minus lower sum less than epsilon, then certainly the upper sum minus the lower sum of the partition on the left has to be less than epsilon. And the partition on the right has upper sum minus lower sum less than epsilon. And basically, that's it. <laughs> this shows, you know, these two statements individually show us that uh, my function f is integrable on p1 and it's integrable on p2. Uh, and so my function f is integrable on the, the left interval and on the right interval. Now let's look at the other direction. I want to prove that if f is integrable on the two smaller intervals, then it's integrable on the interval all the way from a to b. So Given an epsilon greater than zero, there are partitions P1 and P2, like we had before. I'll make C part of that partition. I have a P1 and a partition P2. And 
by my hypothesis, f is integrable on these two intervals, so I can make the upper sum minus lower sum as small as I want. So epsilon was given. Let's make those sum differences less than epsilon over 2. Well, letting p be the union of those two things, so p is just everything all together, that makes a partition of a, b for which the uh, upper sum minus lower sum over p is less than epsilon. And so f is integrable on the entire interval from a to b. Now let's turn our attention to the equation. At this point, we are given the if and only if statement. We know that that's true. And what we have to show is that the integral from a to b of f is the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b. So from before, we know that there are partitions p, p1, and p2, where p1 is some partition from a to c, p2 is some partition from c to b, and a p is the union of those two things. And I can require a couple things. First of all, that uh, the two halves individually have upper sum minus lower sum less than epsilon over 2. And for the entire interval, the p partition, the upper sum minus lower sum is less than epsilon. OK, so given 1 and 2, I want to show this inequality in two directions. So how about less than or equal? The integral from a to b of f, well, that has to be less than the upper sum of my function over partition p. After all, this integral is uh, a lower bound. Uh, for all possible uh, upper sums. But now, if I add a little bit of epsilon to a lower sum, I know I'm going to exceed it, and this inequality actually comes from 2. So it's right there. Do you see if, if I just add uh, the lower sum to both sides, I get the, the inequality. Okay, but now the lower sum of fp plus epsilon, well, the lower sum of fp is really just the lower sum of fp1 plus the lower sum of fp2. OK. And now, by the same argument that I had earlier, I know that the lower sum on the left partition is less than or equal to the integral. And the lower sum on the right partition is less than or equal to that integral. And so we have our inequality. And so, so there it is, but there is a little epsilon hanging on. Um, what do we do with that? Right, so I have the integral from a to b of f is less than or equal to the integral from a to c of f, the integral from b to c of f plus epsilon. And here's the thing, is that this epsilon is chosen arbitrarily. So this equation is true for every positive epsilon. So since it's true for every positive epsilon, in fact, the inequality holds without the epsilon also. So that shows the uh, less than or equal to inequality. Let's go the other direction. And I'll actually show that this sum is less than or equal to the single integral. All right, so the sum, well, let's see, it's less than the two upper sums, like before. Now, those upper sums individually I can use my equation 1, and, or I should say inequality 1. And based on inequality 1, I arrive at an expression that uses the lower sums. But now, those lower sums, I can add those together to get the lower sum of the entire partition. And then that is less than or equal to the actual integral all the way from a to b. And so once again, I have an expression where the sum of the two integrals is less than or equal to the complete integral plus epsilon. And since epsilon is arbitrarily chosen, then in fact, I must have that the sum of the two is less than or equal to uh, the single integral. And I have inequality in the other direction. So inequality in both directions, I must actually have equality. We've just finished talking about uh, the, the first big main uh, property of the integral is the additivity of intervals, how intervals add up nicely. Our author in Theorem 742 
now just throws a whole bunch of other properties at us. And these should all seem you know, pretty reasonable like, like the first one did. Um, don't, let's not forget our hypotheses. We'll assume that f and g are integral functions on the interval from a to b. Then all these things follow. The sum f plus g is integrable. This is how one evaluates the integral of the sum. If k is a constant, then k times f is integrable. And this is how one integrates the integral of uh, kf. If f is bounded below by little m and above by big M, then we have an inequality involving the, the length of the interval and the min and the max. If f is less than g, then the integral of f is less than the integral of g. And the function uh, absolute f is integrable, and the absolute of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute values. Let me talk about this just for a second. This is really interesting. This is a generalization of the triangle inequality. Do you see that? The triangle inequality tells us that the absolute value of a plus b is less than or equal to absolute a plus absolute b. But integrals are really just sums. They're sort of infinite sums. And so if I have an absolute value of an infinite sum, then that's less than or equal to well, the summation, this infinite summation of all the absolute values. So this property number five is, a, is kind of a great generalization of the triangle inequality to an, an infinite sum. That's kind of interesting that the triangle inequality does generalize that way. All right, uh, proofs one and five are given as homework problems. Uh, for now, in this lecture, we'll prove two, three, and four. Two will take a little bit of time, not too bad, uh, but three and four are pretty quick. All right, let's get to it. Let's take a look at number two. All right, so for k, a real number, kf is integrable, and the integral from a to b of kf is k times the integral from a to b of f. So really two things to prove, integrable, and the equation. So let's recall, f is integrable if and only if there is a sequence of partitions, pn, where the limit as n goes to infinity of upper sum minus lower sum is zero. And in this case, how I can calculate the integral of f is by taking the limit of the upper sums or by taking the limit of the lower sums. This was given to us uh, not as a theorem, but in an exercise for an earlier problem. I think it was part A. We didn't actually prove it, but we used it in that problem. All right, so let's observe, to, uh, to get to our proof now of, of number two, let's observe that for any partition P, if K is greater than or equal to zero, well, let's focus on this. The upper sum of K times F over the partition is really the same as k times the upper sum. Perhaps we could see this if I imagine just a single partition, how my function behaves. Let's say if this is my function f, well, k times f just sort of expands that up by a factor of k. And so if I have a maximum value of f, well, that's going to correspond to k times that value in kf. And a similar kind of statement works for the lower sums too. Whatever my lower sum is for f, well, k times that will just be the lower sum for the function kf. All right. Now, as f is integrable, that's part of our hypothesis, there is a sequence of partitions, pn, satisfying star, so up above in my earlier statement. So I really can find... Um, uh, partitions pn with this property. Okay, so let's examine the limit as n goes to infinity with that pn, but instead of using f, what happens if I put kf in there? Well, I can pull the k's out, and now the limit as n goes to infinity of k, that exists, that's just k, and the limit as n goes to infinity of the stuff in brackets exists, that's up above, and that equals zero. And so by my properties of limits, I know that the limit of that product exists, and it is zero. What this tells us is, since this limit, 
equals zero, that means that my boxed expression is true for the function kf. So kf is integrable. And in this case, if I want to evaluate it, I just need to evaluate, say, the upper sum. And when I evaluate the upper sum, the k comes out, and I'm left with k times that integral. All right, not too bad. Let's turn our attention to the proof of 3. So statement 3 says that if, uh, if I have a function f that's bounded below by little m and above by big M, then m, little m times the width is less than or equal to the integral. It's less than or equal to big M times the width of the interval. Now, in this picture, I've, I've drawn it so that big M and little m are exactly the high and exactly the low of the function. But it doesn't actually have to be this case. My, my m could be anything that's actually bigger than the function, and little m could be anything that's actually lower than the function. But for now, let's go on with the proof. Let's note that for any partition p, the lower sum of the function over p is going to be less than or equal to the integral, less than or equal to the upper sum of f over p. That's true for any partition. So in particular, let's consider this. Let, let p be the trivial partition. It only has a left endpoint at a and a right endpoint at b, and it's just one subinterval. That's all it is. Well then, on this subinterval, the m that's bounding below times the width is certainly going to be less than or equal to the lower sum, whatever the the inf of my function is over that interval, and the upper sum is going to be less than or equal to the capital M, which bounds above, uh, and that's exactly what I want. So now my little m times b minus a is less than or equal to L. The L is less than or equal to the uh, integral, which is less than or equal to the u, and then the u is less than or equal to the capital M times uh, b minus a, and that is exactly what I wanted to show in the problem. All right, so that was pretty straightforward, kind of a little clever trick here, just taking the trivial partition. And our last proof is a proof of part four. If function f is less than function g on the interval from a to b, then the integral of f is less than the integral of g. All right. So let's start by making a new variable h. We'll call the call this function h is uh, g minus f. And so notice this, h is not negative, right? Because g is greater than f. So for any x, if I take g minus f, I'll end up with something zero or bigger. All right. So uh, h of x is, uh, is 0 or bigger for all x. And so consequently, 0 is less than or equal to the integral of h. Now, why is that so? Do you remember which property gives that to me? That's actually going to be property 3, the one we just did with the function that was bounded above and below. This function, h, is bounded below by 0. So 0 is less than the integral of h. Well, now, h is really just g plus negative f. That's really no property. That's just how h is defined. So I've just split this up into a sum of two, uh, two integrals. So that was property 1. And now I've taken this factor of negative 1 and I've brought it outside. That's exactly what property 2 told me I was able to do. Oh, but look at that. I have 0 is less than or equal to integral of g minus integral of f. If I add the integral of f to both sides, I end up with uh, integral of f less than or equal to integral of g, which is what I was after. So that proves it. And it's kind of nice to see how these things build. I used properties 1, 2, and 3 to prove 4. Last idea, not really properties to prove, but two definitions that uh, work well with everything else. The integral from a to b and the integral from b to a are negatives of each other. We literally define the integral from a to b to be the negative of the integral from b to a. And also we define the integral from a to a of a function f just to be zero.
these things seem intuitive, but uh, if you think about literally how a, how the integral is defined, having uh, the bigger number on the bottom or having the two limits be the same does not work for the definition of the integral. And now that we have that, uh, it turns out that I can use my additivity of intervals with a, b, and c for any three points. Uh, previously, I had to have c in between a and b, but now c doesn't even have to lie in between a and B. And let me do a, a quick demo to show why that is. So consider this situation. C is between A and B. And as I drag C along, we can see how some of these numbers are changing up above. And what happens if I let C line up exactly with B? Well, this makes sense. My C equals B. And so I get 0 by definition. 14.54 plus 0 equals 14.54. But also, I can drag C beyond here. And so I start off with the integral from A to C, A to C all the way across, plus the integral from C to B, C to B, I come back and subtract off that excess amount. And that will give me the integral from A to B that I had, uh, that I was after initially anyway. So now it doesn't matter how A, B, and C are arranged that additivity of integrals uh, works perfectly well. All right, we're moving on to our next big topic. Uh, that is sequences of functions. How do sequences behave with integrals? Let's suppose that I have a sequence of functions, and the sequence of functions converges to a function f. And each function in the sequence is integrable. Here's my big question. If I take the sequence of integrals, does that converge to the integral of the limit of the functions? Is the limit of the integrals the integral of the limit? And our author says this. This is an archetypical instance of one of the major themes of analysis. When does a mathematical manipulation, such as integration, respect the limiting process? And this is a theme I hope you recall seeing again and again throughout this course. We've seen it with sequences, with series, with functions, with continuity, uh, with differentiation. And now here we are one more time uh, with integration. Well, it turns out that if my functions converge pointwise, then this sequence of integrals need not converge to the integral of the limit. And here's a neat little example to show that. Uh, there's the function expressed uh, symbolically, but maybe it's easier just to look at pictures. So f1 is my function that has a height of 1 and a length of 1. f2 has a height of 2, but length of 1 half. f3 has a height of 3, but it only goes over 1 third. And so what is the limit of this function? What is um, the pointwise limit of this sequence? Where is it going? And if you think about it, it goes to zero because if you fix any x value and you let n go to infinity, then f sub n of x is going to equal zero eventually. All right? Fix your x value, let n go to infinity, f sub n of x will eventually equal zero. So my function actually uh, converges to the flat function, just zero. But what if I take an integral from 0 to 1 of 0, so that's, that's my f function, my limit function, I will get 0. Okay, very good. So I look at the function, I look at the limit of the function, and I see the integral of that limit. But on the other hand, each, each, uh, each function in the sequence individually, what is its integral? Well, I have an area of 1. 2 by 1 half, area of 1, 3 by 1 third, area of 1. In fact, every function in this sequence has an integral from 0 to 1 that's exactly 1. And so the sequence of integrals is just a sequence of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, forever and ever, and that's 1. And so we see that these two things are not the same. So, uh, the, the limit of the integrals need not be the integral of the limit.
But can we do better if we require a stronger type of convergence? And the answer is the integrable limit theorem. Yes. Assume that these functions converge to f uniformly on the closed interval from a to b, and that each fn is integrable. Then the result is integrable, and the limit of all of those integrals is the integral of the limit function. Before we talk about a proof of this, let me just think for a moment. How does this compare with the differentiable limit theorem? Do you remember that? Do you recall it turned out if I had a sequence of functions that converge with uniform convergence uh, to a function f, these guys individually being differentiable did not actually imply that the limit function was differentiable. The key example we had was the absolute value function, and we saw a sequence of functions that were all differentiable at zero, and they converged uniformly to the absolute value, but the, the absolute value isn't differentiable. So although we had a certain failure with the differentiable limit theorem, actually the uh, integral limit theorem is, is pretty good. It gives us what we could hope for. All right, so how about some reasoning behind the uh, integral limit theorem? Why does that thing work? The fact that f is integrable is the result of an exercise, 725. So I, I hate to do this. I, I'm, I am going to wave my hands a little bit and say, uh, I'll, I'm, I'll not cover that. Let's just, let's just accept that as given. But actually, what's really important is the second part. I'd really like to show... If we believe, at least, that f is integrable, then why should it be that the value of that integral is, in fact, the limit of all the other integrals? And we'll see a nice, some nice use of the, uh, the properties that we covered previously. All right, so let's focus on that equality. Now, before we even do this, Maybe we need to cast our minds back to the very beginning of the course again. Remember, when we were just talking about limits of sequences, one of the most important definitions for the entire course, we said, was the definition for convergence of a sequence. What does it mean for the sequence to converge? And that's really all we have here. Here we are at the very end of the semester, and we're using that exact same idea. I have a limit of a sequence, and I'm claiming that it goes there. So what do I want to do? I want to take an absolute value of the terms of my sequence minus the limit of the sequence. And when I do that, I can simplify. Uh, this looks like the uh, difference, the, the integral of the difference of the two functions. So that actually uses properties 1 and 2. And then that's less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. Ah, and there's my property 5. That was the generalization of the triangle inequality for that. And now, let epsilon greater than 0 be given. Since fn goes to f uniformly, oh, I haven't used that yet, so what is the definition of uniform convergence? All right, well, there exists a capital N such that if little n is greater than that capital N, then the difference between those two functions, the, the uh, term function and the limit function is going to be as small as I want. So I can require that uh, it's less than epsilon over b minus a for all x. So this, this, this inequality is independent of my choice of x. That's where the uniform convergence comes from. So there's some capital N so that after a certain point, the difference of the two functions for all x's is less than epsilon over b minus a. All right, so I have from above, the absolute value of the difference of the two integrals is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value that was seen earlier. But now this guy is less than the integral of epsilon over b minus a. So I'm using this inequality. Oh, and that was property 4. If one function is less than another, then the integrals have that same inequality. The integral of fn minus f is less than the integral of epsilon over 
b minus a. And now I'm just integrating a constant, and when I integrate a constant, I get the width times the value, and that's just epsilon. So I think we've done it. We've proven that the difference in my ter the terms minus the limit is less than epsilon, and that proves it. All right, well, that is it. We have reached the end of this lesson. That takes us to the homework. Give these problems a try, three, four, five, and seven. Problem number three is one of those uh, problems where it asks you to prove whether a statement is true or to find a counterexample if the statement is false. Um, just to save yourselves a little bit of time on this particular problem, if the statement is false, please provide a counterexample. But if the statement is true, then simply state so. You don't need to prove it, but just, just write that it's true. All right, give those problems a try. And of course, ask if you have questions. Good luck.